So now that we've talked about the components, the biomacromolecules that make up cells, let's take some time and look at cells themselves. Um, all kinds of pictures. Great. Remember that a cell is the most basic unit of life. Right? So if you're not at least one cell, you're not alive. We've got lots of different kinds of cells. This is E. coli. It's a prokaryotic cell. It's incredibly small. Whereas paramecium is a eukaryotic cell. It's much more complex. It's much larger. Plants, plants that you know, um, are made up of many cells and multicellular organisms. You can in fact see the tiny organelles called chlor chloroplasts as the green dots in this picture. And these are the place, this is the place in the cell where photosynthesis occurs. Um, you have bacteria that have flagella. We'll talk about these to move around. You have all kinds of cool microscopy. This is fluorescent microscopy. We're staining different proteins in the cell. These are components of the cytoskeleton in this picture and in this one. So we'll talk about these different aspects of cell as we, cells as we um, cover cellular anatomy. But we do need to talk about some basics first. If, if the cell is the most basic unit of life, what does it really mean to be alive? And when we look at all the different kinds of life that are out there, we can kind of break it down to some very general ideas. And these are characteristics that all life expresses. So on an individual level, if some individual thing, some individual organism is alive, it must display order, right? Um, it must have some degree of regulation. They have to be able to regulate their internal or immediate environment such that it is conducive to life as we know it. All living things grow and develop, right? Um, all living things utilize energy. They have to take in energy, transform it for life activities. And finally, all living things on an individual level must respond to the environment. Right? If you don't respond to the environment, you won't be alive very long. Now, on a species level, we talk about the mechanism to be able to reproduce yourself, and with that comes the ability, ultimately, um, to be influenced by evolution. So, again, this idea is on a species level because, one, populations evolve, individuals do not, and we'll talk about that later. But also, if you think about my cat, who's fixed, she can't have any more babies, she can't reproduce, is she alive? Of course she's alive. But as a species, felines have a mechanism to reproduce and make more cats. So we want to think about these as we move through um, our survey of life later in the quarter. Now, what this lends itself to then is back to the cell theory. So this is, again, more stuff that I want you to kind of commit to memory. The cell theory has three points. It basically states that a cell is the smallest unit of life. That means all living things are at least one cell or more. Based on our observations, so far, all we know is that cells come from the division of other cells. We've never seen a cell spontaneously arise. Right? And finally, all cells contain hereditary material in the form of DNA that they pass to their offspring during cell division. When a cell reproduces, it makes copies of that DNA and hands it off to the next generation. And we're going to understand how that works much better as we go on through the quarter. But for now, we want to lay down those basic ideas, these very fundamental principles um, for cells. Now, again, we talked about lipids forming membranes. And I want to go back and revisit the plasma membrane just briefly. Because it really is super important to a cell. If you don't have that wall, that bilayer, right, made of lipids and proteins, you don't have a cell, right? You've got to have a bag, that greasy bag, into which you put the biochemistry that is life. And what we're ultimately going to see is that you have that, wall, that, that membrane that allows you to create different concentrations, that allows you to create gradients. And those gradients, as they dissipate and move, that ultimately is the life process. Life really is a process. Right? So when we look at that membrane, again, we can see in here that we've got proteins stuck in that membrane because proteins do stuff. They're going to make this membrane active and selective. And that's going to be very, very important. So when we look at this, you can see in the electron micrograph on the left, the outside of the cell, and then you have that membrane. That membrane is going to be the barrier to the inside and the outside of the cell. Everything inside the cell we're going to call the cytoplasm. That membrane, then, is going to be responsible 
for allowing only some things to come in, into the cell and only some things to exit the cell. If it didn't, you wouldn't be able to regulate the processes of life. So cellular membranes must be selectively permeable, and that's the special term that I want you to remember. They're active and selective. Proteins, because proteins do stuff, are going to regulate what moves across the membrane. They don't let everything move because they're selective. Okay? So again, everything inside the plasma membrane that membrane is responsible for maintaining ultimately is called the cytoplasm. All right? So again, these are commonalities to all cells. Because if a cell is the most basic unit of life, every cell must have a plasma membrane that separates it from the environment. This is going to be our most fundamental aspect of every cell. And again, now here we can see many of our classes of biomacromolecules. We know that we have lipids in a bilayer that are going to form the basis of our membrane. We have proteins in that membrane, right? And in addition, then, we have um, carbohydrates, right? Carbohydrates are associated with lipids, okay? Glycolipids and Carbohydrates associated with proteins, glycoproteins. We can mix and match our biomacromolecules, and that's really important to remember as well. All right? So with that, then, we can think a little bit more about the proteins in the membrane. And remember, proteins are a polymer of amino acids. They're going to be made up of different kinds of amino acids. Now, when we look at this and think about the structure of the lipid bilayer, those proteins are going to have clusterings of hydrophobic amino acids in the regions of the protein that are associated with the hydrophobic re regions of the bilayer. In essence, what you've done is anchored that protein into the membrane through hydrophobicity, right? Because all the hydrophobic stuff wants to stay away from water, you can kind of anchor that membrane, or you can anchor that protein in the membrane by using hydrophobic amino acids when you build it in those regions of the protein. Basic stuff, but really, really important for understanding how life works, right? And again, those proteins are going to be in, involved in moving stuff across the membrane, and we'll talk about this more um, later as well. So these are this is one very, very fundamental aspect to all cells. Now, as we talk about cells, we can start to break cells down into two major groups, and we talked about this before, but we're going to revisit it again. There are two major kinds of cells out there, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Most of the things that you're familiar with in your life um, on a macro scale are eukaryotes or cells made of you um, are organisms made of eukaryotic cells and when we look at the domains of life the three major types of life that are out there bacteria archaea and eukarya bacteria and archaea are prokaryotic cells and these are what you think of as bacteria and we'll talk about the details of that a little bit later as well but then eukarya are bugs and plants and mushrooms and your dog and your cat and your fish all of those are made of eukaryotic cells. So again, most of the stuff that you're familiar with is um, in eukarya, but all of these cells originated from some early population. Um, we have the same common ancestor. So we talk about the earliest organisms. We talk about a common ancestor to all life. Right? So again, just to remind you, prokaryotic cells are going to be small, and eukaryotic cells are going to be big. So let's talk about that a little bit more and compare and contrast um, eukaryotic cells with prokaryotic cells. So <clears throat> prokaryotic cells are just one room, right? So you have that cell, plasma membrane. Everything that is inside the plasma membrane is in one room. There's no uh, partitioning of a prokaryotic cell. Those little purple dots, all that's inside them is the cytoplasm, and in that cytoplasm is going to float the um, DNA, ribosomes to make proteins, um, and then the biochemistry. Now, a eukaryotic cell is going to be much, much larger. It's going to have a partitioning of the internal environment. Right? So this is much more like a house or a mansion where it has many, many rooms. And each room is made to optimize the activity in that room. So when you walk into a big mansion and you have this beautiful kitchen, um, you know that you can cook well in there because you have all the things you need to cook. And it has a library, and it has lots of books and places to read, and you can read well in there because it's made to be read in. But you wouldn't try to cook in the library. Now, again, that prokaryotic cell, in contrast, is more like a studio apartment. Like, everything you need is right in there. You've got your TV on the wall, you've got your bed and your sofa and your kitchenette all in the same room, 
which allows you to do lots of things in that one room, but none of those things as well as if you had a room dedicated to that activity. So we want to think about that as we compare those two major cell types. So prokaryotes tend to be small, 0.1 to 10 micrometers in size, where eukaryotes are about 10 times the size. Prokaryotic cells are what we call no membrane-bound organelles. So there aren't little bags inside the bag that is the cell. There's no partitioning. Eukaryotic cells, lots of partitioning. And we'll go over that partitioning in great detail over the next couple of lectures. We want to think about prokaryotic cells being small, or eukaryotic cells are big. Prokaryotic cells are small studio apartments, or eukaryotic cells are mansion, is a mansion with many rooms. Prokaryotic cells are always single-celled organisms, whereas eukaryotic cells can be single-celled or they can gather together to make a multicellular organism like yourself. Now, the other thing we need to think about when we talk about cells is the size. We talk about 0.1 to 10 micrometers. If you don't know what a micrometer is, that doesn't mean much. So let's look at the scale here to kind of review that idea. So when we look at this, <clears throat> what we can see is that, you know, a person is somewhere between 1 and 2 meters in height, right? And so that's about, you know, 3 to 6 feet. That's a pretty broad range. But as we get smaller and smaller, we see chicken egg, and down a frog, and now we have the centimeters, millimeters, and so below millimeters are micrometers. All right? So a micron is one one millionth of a meter, or you can think about as the distance between two millimeter marks on a ruler, there's a thousand microns. All right? So that's pretty small. Um, most eukaryotic cells are going to be in that you know, 10 to 100 range. Most animal cells are going to be like 20 to 50 microns. Most plant cells are more like 80 to 100 microns. Now, you go down a whole other order of magnitude, now you get down to that 10 micron range, now you're looking at the largest bacteria. In the lower range there, you're now looking at the organelles that are inside a eukaryotic cell. So the rooms inside a eukaryotic cell can be about as big as a prokaryotic cell. So again, it talks to this idea that a eukaryote is much, much bigger. Below that, now you get into nanometers, right? So a nanometer is going to be, there's going to be a thousand nanometers in one micron. And so now you're going to, the, the, to viruses, and now you're getting to large molecules um, and proteins and so on and so forth, down to all the way to what we call angstroms, or one-tenth of a nanometer, and that is at an atomic level. So before we finish, let's look at the quick anatomy of a prokaryotic cell. And they're very simple. So prokaryotes, again, are comprised of uh, bacteria and archaea. Those are the two groups of prokaryotes that we see. And again, being a, that one-room studio apartment, um, we can look at the anatomy of a prokaryotic cell in pretty much one slide. And what we want to point out here is that <clears throat> this is a great thing to start with to understand cells. Always kind of zero in on the plasma membrane first, because that's our delineation. Now, just because that delineates the edge of the cell doesn't mean that there aren't things outside the plasma membrane that are important. In this case, outside the plasma membrane um, is the cell wall. And outside that, depending on the species, is a thick capsule. And that's like a mucus-like layer that the cell secretes. Now, going in from the plasma membrane, everything inside is called the cytoplasm. And in there are going to be floating tiny um, bodies that are called ribosomes. And those are important to making proteins. Also, in prokaryotic cells, we oftentimes have what's called a nucleoid region. And though the DNA isn't in its own compartment, it tends to be kind of a sequestered in one region of the cell. So <clears throat> these are things that you should be familiar with. In addition um, to those things I've mentioned so far, you also have pili, which are the short projections from a prokaryotic cell. Some prokaryotic cells have these, some do not. And they are going to allow it to stick to stuff. And then some prokaryotic cells have flagella, which are these whip-like structures for locomotion. So those last two structures, the pili and the flagella, tend to be kind of options. It's like your car may have a sunroof or it may not, um, but you don't need a sunroof to have your car function. So flagella and pili tend to be um, optional, depending on the species. So you should be familiar with um, a prokaryotic cell and its anatomy. And what we're going to do next, then, is talk about the eukaryotic cell <clears throat> and spend a lot more time on that because that's the kind of cell that makes up you.